Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Matthew Hofarth. Today is July 27th, 2021, and I'm speaking with Alberto Martinez, who is Professor of History at the University of Texas at Austin. His research explores the history of physics, mathematics, scientific myths, and the relationship between science and religion, and he also works on the history of notions of race, myths in political news media, and the history of money and corruption. Today, we are speaking with Alberto about his book, Burned Alive, Bruno, Galileo, and the Inquisition. Thank you for joining us, Alberto. Hi, Matt. Glad to be here. To begin, let me ask you to give us some background on what was happening both socially and religiously in 16th century Europe that sets the stage for this story. Well, um, it's a time of great uh, religious conflicts and controversies. The Catholic Church uh, has lost half of Europe because of the actions of Martin Luther, John Calvin, and others that have said about various Protestant churches. By the mid-16th century, uh, 1542, Pope Paul III had created the Supreme Universal Inquisition to to help keep the integrity of the Catholic faith and to uh, find errors and doctrines that are wrong, uh, essentially to try to hold Christianity together against what the Protestants had been achieving. At about that time, we've got uh, Copernicus coming out with his book on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres and um, Copernicus dies, but then there's a um, movement within certain levels of the church to repudiate or deny some of what Copernicus has said. So that doesn't become public until years later, but it's there. We've got at the same time also the Council of Trent, so the church is reintroducing um, uh, all kinds of strict measures to, to, again, hold the faith together and to persecute and prosecute heresies in, in, a, in a highly bureaucratic manner. That was a change to what they, they previously had. For example, they create the Index of Forbidden Books to prohibit and censure offensive works, to prevent the spread of Protestantism and, and heresies. And um, finally, I'd say that they're becoming increasingly severe in their measures of punishment, including the death penalty. So by the 1590s, which is when uh, Giordano Bruno is imprisoned, there are multiple representatives of the Catholic Church that have become not just hostile to Protestant beliefs, but also to beliefs of ancient philosophers, what they call pagan beliefs. So who was Giordano Bruno? And why does his story matter to the history of science and to the history of religion? Well, he uh, trained originally as a Catholic friar, and um, he found that he didn't like it, so he fled. And he wanders around Europe, studying interesting ideas, including the work of Copernicus. And um, he writes many books, so he becomes a famous writer. And travels from one group to another, sometimes uh, being rejected by various congregations. So just as he fell out with the Catholics, he falls out with the Calvinists and the Lutherans. And eventually when he goes back to Venice to educate a nobleman that wanted to hire him, that nobleman reports him to the Inquisition of Venice. And the ideas that Bruno has voice that helped to get him in trouble include things that we now view as scientific, such as the belief that the earth moves and that the, there are many worlds, that is, other planets are in some sense similar to the earth and that the stars are suns and that they're surrounded by worlds. So this is stuff that is not merely theological, but uh, one would say back then that it's natural philosophy. These are what we now call scientific concerns about the universe, about space, about the stars. And he gets in trouble for that. 
Alberto, we sent your book to a couple of interested readers, and they recorded a number of questions for you. To start, let's hear a question from Vivian Vincent. Bruno didn't do any astronomical work himself, apparently. You clearly paint the influence of so-called Pythagorean ideas in his work. Do we know enough about his work, though, to determine how Bruno came up with his notions about a movable Earth and such? Was he trying to build on Pythagorean ideas, or did he use them to justify his reasoning? Well, um, it's common to say that Bruno is not an astronomer, but I think that's mainly because we take a modern view of what astronomy is. Uh, Back in the late 16th century, there are mainly two kinds of astronomy. There is the uh, astronomy of observing the heavens very carefully and measuring the positions of stars and describing planets and stars, describing events that happen in the heavens like comets. And then there's also this mathematical astronomy of accounting with uh, diagrams or equations for these changes in the heavens, these planetary motions. And that's, for example, the work of Copernicus and Kepler. So if we look at those two kinds of astronomy, uh, it's true that Giordano Bruno is not one of them. But neither is Galileo. Galileo is not measuring stars and planets in the sense that someone like Tycho Brahe uh, measured them. Instead, Galileo happens to apply this new instrument, the telescope, to look at the heavens, and he describes some of the things he sees. But nobody else had such things. So what Galileo is doing is it's, it's a new kind of astronomy that also involves thinking physically about the heavens. Now, other people had done that, and one of them is Giordano Bruno. In other words, it involves things that we might now call cosmology and astrophysics. What is the sun? Giordano Bruno answers, it's one of the stars. Uh, What are the stars? They're suns. They're surrounded by planets, etc. So in in that sense, uh, Giordano Bruno is doing what we now would recognize as a kind of scientific work. That's just not the word that's used back then. Back then, the word is natural philosophy, and that's what Giordano, Bruno, and Galileo both uh, see themselves as doing. Now, why does his story matter for history of science and religion? It matters partly because the ideas, the concepts that Bruno is wrestling with and advancing successfully are many of the concepts that we still believe. Universe is not a sphere, that it has no center, that it is unbounded, that it is somewhat a homogeneous distribution of stars in an unstructured manner, that the sun is not the center of the universe, that the earth moves around the sun. This is what he's describing, and this is what we believe in. And it's very progressive. At the time, people like Kepler and Galileo did not believe in these things. Um, uh, They instead believed the universe is spherical. It has a center. At the center of the universe is located the sun. And Giordano Bruno is dismissing those ideas very rationally as being incorrect. There's a sub-question about the idea of the movable Earth. Where does he get that? He gets that from Copernicus. He has read Copernicus's book on the revolutions of 1543. He becomes convinced that Copernicus is right, the Earth is moving, and he goes on to build on that. He's not so much trying to build on Pythagorean ideas as just use them, to some extent defend them. In, In other words, if If he happens to agree with these beliefs of the so-called Pythagoreans, then he uses them to kind of justify his own reason, while other people say used other authorities, like Plato and Aristotle. Bruno often uh, tends to use uh, the Pythagoreans. Alberto, we have another question from a reader, this time from Lisa Knox. Here she is. Considering that Giordano Bruno was a cleric who knew well the church's opposition to Pythagorean philosophy and of the existence of the Inquisition, why was he not more circumspect about how he articulated his theories? Or did he find courage in the ability of church's most vocal critics to establish Protestant sects? It's an interesting question. My impression is that Giordano Bruno does not really know what's wrong, according to the Catholic cardinals of the Inquisition. He doesn't know what's wrong in what he has written and what he has said. The reason I say that is because uh, he has some such exchange in uh, uh, 1599 uh, in which he 
ask one of the inquisitor, can you please ask the Pope whether these things that are being uh, put forth against me are new heresies that have recently been declared as such, or whether this is uh, stuff that has been around for a while. The Pope does send his official reply, and it is that these are not new heresies, but heresies that have been condemned by the most ancient church fathers. That exchange shows that Giordano Bruno, until that moment, he doesn't realize that what he's doing is wrong to the Catholics. So you take a, a book like the uh, Corpus of Canon Law, the, the code of laws that ruled over the Catholic Church. How widely was that disseminated? How many people read it? My impression is that very few people read that. It's not something that was at hand available to anyone. Certainly it was available to inquisitors who poured over these pages. And if you pour through those pages, now this tome is from 1582, um, reissued in several editions and ruling over all church courts. If you pour over these pages, you will find that it is a heresy, that is a crime against God to believe that innumerably many worlds exist. So it's listed as a heresy. Had Giordano Bruno read that? Did he know that? My guess is no, he didn't. And similarly, historians of science didn't know this. Uh, five, ten years ago, a uh, hundred years ago, they just didn't know this because there is an arsenal of other books to be read. You, you have to be a real expert to actually come across some of these things. And back then, people like one of the theologians that confronts Giordano Bruno, Cardinal Bellarmine, that also later confronts Galileo, he knew. He had read the ancient church fathers, ranging from St. Jerome, St. Augustine, Isidore. Many of these people, all three that I mentioned and multiple others, did condemn the view of many worlds. But it was not a common accusation, for example, at the moment. So Giordano Bruno, we have many records of how he defended himself at the Inquisition in Venice and the Inquisition in Rome. And again and again, he claims that he has not departed from Catholic dogma. He claims to be a Catholic. He claims to believe in Jesus and the Virgin Mary and the dogmas and the apostles. And he is very defensive about this. And he's shocked when people say that he has said bad things about Jesus Christ. He's just very shocked and apparently offended that anybody would say that about him. So, so he seems to be caught in this juncture of not knowing to what extent the things he has been doing and what he, he, to him is just natural philosophy are actually stepping on the toes of theologians and church fathers who think he has no right to be discussing these things. Now, the question also said something about uh, Protestant sects. I don't think that that he gets courage from them, um, maybe, but he doesn't say that because he, he claims not to agree with them. They say, well, you know, you were in Lutheran places and you read Protestant books. He said, you know, I read some of that stuff out of curiosity, but he doesn't write as someone who is adopting a particular brand of Protestantism and therefore striking against the church. No, instead he writes or defends himself as someone who is a Catholic Christian who was just exercising in his humanist right to discuss natural philosophy and what we call astronomy. So, so I think he's not circumspect because he's, made, he's making a mistake. He doesn't realize to what extent the things he's saying are extremely offensive. But before we move on, let me say why they're offensive. They're offensive mainly because in claiming that the moon is another world, that it has mountains, valleys, rivers, trees, and that the planets are other worlds and the stars are other worlds and they are other solar systems. By saying this, People at the time believed that someone who says such things is opposing the Catholic account of creation and Genesis, which is one God created one world that was later redeemed by one Christ. So if there are many worlds, the apostles cannot travel to those worlds to tell them the message that Jesus Christ has arrived. And therefore, Jesus Christ has to be born and crucified in each of those infinite worlds so that 
those beings and those alien beings can be redeemed. And to Catholics back then, that was highly offensive, absurd, and ridiculous. And 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 then they, you know, they strike out against a guy like Giordano Bruno. That the church and the church fathers were against this belief in many worlds. Does that imply that there were people before Giordano Bruno who were saying things like this that they saw as dangerous? On the one hand, the claim back then is to attribute these beliefs to Pythagoras. But Pythagoras himself, we have no records of Pythagoras actually saying anything about many worlds. What we do know were that people who came later and called themselves Pythagoreans, that is the followers of Pythagoras, one, two, three centuries later, some of these people say that that there are these other worlds and that uh, when you die, your soul can be reborn in another person or another animal and that that being might well even be living in another world. So eventually there are stories about Pythagoras himself traveling to other worlds or traveling to the moon. And people like Johannes Kepler and Giordano Bruno and Galileo are reading these ancient accounts of, uh, say, the story of uh, Lucian of Samosara about a voyage to the moon and seeing these references about Pythagoras. But regarding Christianity, the early church, what they encounter are various pagan beliefs, including Pythagoreanism, but various pagan beliefs that claim that there are these other worlds and some of those people who say those beliefs are are christian or they're trying to be christian and that's where the trouble happens because to catholic people in the early church and in the renaissance it's fine if someone has beliefs that are not christian the catholic church does not set itself the mission of uh processing through an inquisition every jew or every Muslim, or every pagan, etc., in the world. They, that, that's not their goal. They can't start arresting everyone who just doesn't believe in Christianity. The problem to the Catholic Church or its high officers is different. It is once you've accepted that Christ, God, and the Bible are the way, once you've accepted the Christian path, you can no longer believe those things. That's the problem. Anyone who, having accepted Christianity, then says, oh, and by the way, I have the powers of Jesus Christ, or I was once a snake in another world, or I think I'm going to be born again after I die, or my soul travels to different worlds when I sleep. You start saying those things. You are asserting things that are not part of Christianity. And, and that is what it is to be a heretic. A heretic is a Christian who chooses not to believe the dogmas of Christianity. So going back to your to your question, Matt, which is, who were other people before Giordano Bruno that talked about other worlds? Well, some of those people became designated as heretics by the early church. And for example, the Manichaeans, uh, the followers of Mani, they said that there are other worlds and that there are beings living in those worlds. And they were called heretics. Now, Mani himself calls himself an apostle of Christ. That's his way of seeing things. But their beliefs are criminalized by, by the early church. Similarly, the Borborites were kind of uh, Gnostics. Uh, they also talked about many worlds, and they were considered uh, heretics by the early church. And similarly, there, there are multiple other groups who assert this belief. And because it was asserted by these pseudo-Christians, individuals like uh, the Bishop of Brescia, who becomes known as St. Philaster, St. Augustine, and multiple others, they officially denounced these beliefs as heresies. That is crimes against God. And then Giordano Bruno brings them back. The reason we call him Pythagorean is only because Pythagoras lived earlier than most of these other groups that I've mentioned. But... In the church history, normally uh, heresies are known by the names of the Christian heretics that practice them, not by the name of the pagan originators. So, uh, so, so often you'll see different names being attributed to, to the same heresy. Here's another question from Vivian Vincent. Who were the new Pythagoreans exactly? 
How did they identify themselves, or did they as such? Um, that's an important question. Uh, the new Pythagoreans were uh, labeled as such by uh, some of their critics, especially. By, um, uh, in 1631, there is a book by a theology professor in Belgium, uh, Libert Froidmont, and he complains. He says, the new Pythagoreans, also known as the Copernicans, are teaching, for example, that the earth moves. Um, uh, he says that this group, the new Pythagoreans, is a particularly alien sect that has invaded the Catholic faith. And he names some of them. Some of these new Pythagoreans, Kepler, Michael Maislin, William Gilbert, Antonio Foscarini, and Galileo. So here you have it, like, uh, this actual grouping. Similarly, uh, one of the Jesuits, the one who writes the most critical report against Galileo, he writes this whole manuscript that I analyzed in some length, in which, uh, which is titled Vindication of the Holy Apostolic See Against the New Pythagoreans. Uh, and the title basically means Vindication of the Pope Against the Copernicans. And in that book, where Inchofer talks about the New Pythagoreans, he repeatedly refers to Copernicus, Kepler, Gilbert, uh, Philip van Landsberg, and of course, um, he mentions Galileo, but for the most part, he abstains mentioning the, the Catholic New Pythagoreans, Bruno, Foscarini, Zuniga, Campanella, and Galileo, partly because some of these guys, or all of them, have been declared heretics, so he can't write about them. So instead, he he's railing against the Protestant Pythagoreans when actually his mind is foremost centered on the Catholics, as one can see by, by reading the account that he gives. Obviously, your book is subtitled Bruno, Galileo, and the Inquisition. So how did Bruno's story become intertwined with the trial of Galileo? It's an important question. Um, uh, it's, it's a difficult question to answer because of two factors. On the one hand, uh, Bruno becomes a heretic, an obstinate, impenitent heretic, you know, this is how he gets condemned. So they burn him alive in Rome in 1600 for his beliefs, February 17. Now, once someone is declared a heretic, Catholics cannot read that person's books. So his books, all of them, get placed on the index of forbidden books. You can no longer read them, you can no longer buy them, you can no longer sell them. And these books get burned also um, uh, in St. Peter's Square. And so, so now these topics that are many of the same topics that Galileo subsequently writes about cannot be discussed in print. So Galileo cannot write about Giordano Bruno because it is illegal. So when I say that there are two difficulties... One of the difficulties in understanding the overlap between Giordano Bruno and Galileo is that even though Galileo does follow and build upon the things that Bruno has written, Galileo does not write about Bruno because he can't. He literally cannot be writing about a heretic, otherwise he'll get arrested. The second layer is, because Giordano Bruno is a heretic and the Catholic Church held such enormous influence over Europe, throughout the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, even the 20th century. He is in a way removed, written out of the history of philosophy and science. So, so even presently, there are people who have what I would call a phobia against Giordano Bruno because they believe that uh, he was an idiot. They think he was a mystic. They think that his ideas were moronic. They think that he was a non-scientist. And they think he was also personally a jerk. So they say, oh, this guy got in trouble not only with the Catholics, but with the Protestants, the Calvinists, the Lutherans. Everybody wanted to kill him. He kind of deserved to die. So coincidentally, I'll mention, you know, uh, Steven Weinberg died recently. And uh, he, he had that belief. You know, once he asked me, what are you working on? I said, I'm working on a book about Giordano Bruno. And, you know, he scoffed a bit. And I asked him, have you ever read anything uh, he ever he ever read and he replied i haven't and i never will and and he said it with pride like it was this filthy thing that one should not touch so what i'm getting at is this is the second dimension that makes the question that you raise difficult which is that because the catholic church dominated over europe and to some extent controlled 
the history of intellectual thought, Giordano Bruno was stained as a non-topic for a long time, as something unworthy of serious analysis. So even presently, there are people who say are astronomers, and they have a phobia against Giordano Bruno. They don't know why. And it's because the Catholic Church created a public relations um, uh, assault and the memory of Giordano Bruno. So suppose we overcome both of these obstacles, the first one being the censorship, and secondly, the downcasting of Giordano Bruno as an important intellectual that affects people even to this day. If we overcome these, then to, to look at the overlap between uh, how Bruno's story leads to Galileo, all we gotta do is then compare their works. And we, got, we will find these two guys are writing about some of the same things. To give you one example, Copernicus does not say, suggest, or predict that innumerably many stars exist. That's just not something that Copernicus does. Giordano Bruno does it. He asserts again and again that innumerably or infinitely many stars exist that are invisible to the naked eye. Now, when Galileo publishes his book, Siderius Nuncius, um, having made multiple discoveries with his telescope, he publishes this book, literally means Message from the Stars, in 1610. The subtitle of his book is The Discovery of Innumerable Stars. In other words, Galileo has confirmed what Giordano Bruno has predicted. Neither Kepler nor Copernicus predicted such a thing. Similarly, Giordano Bruno says that the moon is a world somehow similar to the earth, that it has mountains, valleys, forests, rivers. Um, uh, Galileo uses the telescope, and again, he confirms that the moon does look like the earth, at least in as much as it has mountains, valleys, and possibly, apparently, bodies of water. So here we have, again, this is something that uh, Copernicus did not say, he did not predict. Giordano Bruno wrote that the the moon that we see is not the only moon, but that there are other planets with other moons. There are many moons. Galileo, with his telescope, confirms it. He sees several moons around Jupiter. And, you know, he draws them, he discusses them in his book of 1610. So when Johannes Kepler, well-respected astronomer, reads Galileo's book of 1610, he writes a reply titled Conversation or Dissertation with the Starry Messenger. And in that reply, he complains that Galileo does not mention Bruno at all. So in that reply by Kepler, Kepler mentions Giordano Bruno more times than Copernicus because he realizes quite transparently that Galileo is writing about what Giordano Bruno has been discussing. Galileo in that book is not writing about the Earth's motion. He's writing about this, you know, apparent existence of other worlds, etc. And the question is, are there other beings in those other worlds? It's a question... Uh, asserted by Giordano Bruno. He says there are. Galileo touches upon the question but steps back knowing that it is a dangerous question for Catholics. But Kepler writes that he praises Galileo for improving the doctrines borrowed from Bruno. He writes that literally. So, so to someone alive, when Galileo publishes his book, it is quite transparently, eminently clear as evinced in the writings of Kepler and many others, that what he is doing is building on the discoveries of Bruno or the claims of Bruno in some way confirming them. To us, it isn't. So, so to historians of science now, they simply say, well, you know, uh, I don't see uh, Galileo mentioned Bruno anywhere, so uh, Bruno is a non-scientist. And they don't understand. There are these two layers of censorship affecting the way the history was written. But if you just read the, the writings of of astronomers in Protestant countries, such as Kepler and others, you see that they have no trouble in linking and seeing the connection between Bruno and Galileo. Now, my argument is that connection is also seen by the expert Catholic cardinal inquisitors, and um, they are offended that, that Galileo's work is in some sense validating things that have already been criminalized in Bruno's works. That's extremely interesting, Alberto. We have a follow-up question on this topic from Lisa Knox. Can you please talk about the parallels between Bruno's Ash Wednesday dialogue and Galileo's dialogue concerning two world systems? Bruno's Ash Wednesday Supper 
published in uh, 1584 is one of two books that he publishes that year asserting the, the Earth's motion. The other one is on the infinite universe and worlds. So Galileo's book on the two world systems is published in 1632. So we're talking about a difference of 48 years between these, these books. And it's very impressive the degree to which Giordano anticipates or um, uh, preempts some of these arguments by Galileo. To give you one example, nowadays it's common for physics professors and astronomers to credit Galileo with what they call the principle of relativity, because Galileo explained that processes that happen inside of a uniformly moving ship on still waters are identical to processes that happen on the land. So they say uh, motion is relative. And this thing that shows up in Galileo's book of 1632 already shows up in uh, Giordano Bruno's writings of 1584. Similarly, Galileo's dialogue is a dialogue between characters that are discussing cosmology and at some points in a comical way. And that's what Giordano Bruno is doing in 1584. And in the 1584 uh, book, Ash Wednesday Supper, Giordano Bruno has his characters, uh, for example, one called Theophil, refer to the writings of a famous man known as the Nolan, the guy from Nola. In his dialogue, Giordano Bruno has the characters refer to himself. And they talk about him in the third person. Galileo does the same thing. His characters talk about Galileo in the third person, only that they call him the academician. Some of the other parallels, for example, are, as I mentioned, that uh, both writers claim that, that the moon has a terrain with mountains and valleys. Both writers discuss the idea of whether there are rational beings living in other worlds, including the moon. Giordano Bruno simply says yes. Galileo goes as far in 1632 as to defend that even though there might not be humans living on the moon, there might be rational beings that live on the moon and look up and admire the beauty of God's creation. So among the differences, of course, these books also have differences. Among the differences is that uh, Giordano Bruno again and again refers to the moving earth as an animal. He believes the earth is a living being, and that's why it moves, because the earth is a rational living being. Well, now, we don't agree with that, or, or we might not, except so there's some people who have all kinds of notions about a Gaia hypothesis, where they do see the earth as a living system or organism. But, you know, astronomers generally don't. So Galileo doesn't write that way, for the most part. In a few letters, he comes close, but in his books, he doesn't. Another difference, and I'll uh, wrap it up with this, is that um, Bruno's cosmology on the whole is more advanced than what Galileo is doing, because Bruno has realized already, as I said, 48 years earlier, that the sun is not the center of the universe. And Galileo only vaguely mentions that in the dialogue, uh, very tepidly, one of the characters in Galileo's dialogue 1632 says, the stars, which are so many suns, that comes very close to saying that because the stars are suns, then the sun is not the center of the universe. But it doesn't quite say it. But Giordano Bruno is categorical that the sun is not the center. The sun is not the largest star. It's not, not the most important star. It's just one star among many uh, and he goes on and on about this with very accurate additional statements that the other stars are moving, that the sun is moving, that there are uh, planets around these stars, that those planets, some of them might resemble the Earth, that they can be inhabited, that they have moons. Uh, Galileo is far, far more timid in uh, in talking about those things, at least. And, and to, to some extent, I think it is because he did know that to actually support the views of Bruno, the, the belief in many worlds, was a crime and that he could get in trouble for that. We have another follow-up question, uh, this time from Vivian Vinson. To what degree did Galileo himself identify or not as a Pythagorean? Good question. Um, uh, I think Galileo does not identify as a Pythagorean. In the 17th century, Pythagoreanism has a particular shape 
having to do with um, numerology and uh, divination and making predictions. There was something known as the Wheel of Pythagoras. So th there are layers of mysticism in what became known as uh, Pythagoreanism in the 17th century, starting most prominently with the idea that after you die, your soul travels to a different body and is reborn even in the body of an animal or even in another world. Galileo does not go on the record supporting any such ideas. So I don't think he identifies as a Pythagorean, except mainly in a certain respect for arithmetic, mathematics, um, and certainly in the belief that, that the Earth orbits this body, which Aristotle says the Pythagoreans called a central fire. But if you read closely, of course, that central fire was not the sun. The sun also orbited the central fire, but pull him a little closer to Pythagoras. Um, Galileo becomes a member in 1611 of the so-called Academy of the Lynx. And uh, according to some of the members, they modeled that group on what they called the school of Pythagoras. So, for example, one of the members, Ioannis Faber, in 1624, he... Um, he talks about this on page one of his book about the prescriptions from the Academy of the Lynx. He says that, that the name of philosophers for the Lynxes, these members, lacks all pride because even though they're knowledgeable men, they want to be known as friends and lovers of Pythagorean knowledge. So this is a guy in 1624 talking about the Academy of the Lynx, of which Galileo was a member. And similarly, for, for multiple other people who were simply astronomers, philosophers, or theologians, anyone who said that the Earth is a moving body or some of the other astronomical things that we've discussed was considered a Pythagorean. So, so I can give you multiple examples from the Danish astronomer Christian Longomontanus to Jesuits like uh, Melchior Inchofer, who refer to the Pythagoreans, and they say that that say Giordano Bruno is one of them, or uh, Galileo is another one, and Kepler is another one. So this is a way in which people categorized Galileo, even if he didn't uh, put it as prominently. As you've made clear here, and as your book also describes, Bruno has been both intentionally and unintentionally forgotten or misconstrued. What can the persecution of Bruno teach us about the relationship between science and religion today? So it's a difficult question, partly because my book is not about the present. And of course, there are so many religions and so many branches of science and so many interrelations that, that it's, it's, it's not easy to, to just pin it down. But, but one thing to get towards an answer is the following. We have to come to grips with the way to which the distant past of the Catholic Church shaped our intellectual landscape. In the 17th century, the Catholic Church, because of the Inquisition, is very much a totalitarian system. In the Orwellian sense of George Orwell, of actually the, the, the Inquisition wants to not just have you say the things that they want you to say, but they want you to believe them. They want to get into your mind and fix it. So the, the Inquisition did not merely seek to, say, punish people like Giordano Bruno. They could have punished him very easily and get it done with. Instead, they have him in jail for seven or eight years. And the issue is to educate him. They're trying to brainwash him. They're trying to, to literally wash his mind, to fix it, to remove these pagan heresies that have flowered and flourished in his mind like a disease. So... So once you have this, this powerful organization shaping the way that we conceive of certain individuals like Giordano Bruno, like he seems to be a, a, a jerk, a moron, an idiot, an unscientist, a mystic. Once you have this kind of propaganda machine, both censoring and reshaping the way someone is seen, it's very hard to understand the present because... It's been somewhat defined by these images that we have, whether it's the 
conflict between Galileo and the church or the conflict between Giordano Bruno and the church, those conflicts, you know, for decades, the historians, we've been struggling to understand them. And um, one of the easy solutions nowadays, which I think is lousy and I think it's a cop-out and I think it's an example of poor thought, is what uh, biologist Stephen Jay Gould called uh, non overlapping magisteria. He said the way we should think about religion and science is that they are these two domains and that they deal with different things. This is an old idea, for example, that astronomy teaches us how the heavens go, not how to go to heaven. That kind of uh, cartoonish view. There's no overlap between religion and science, therefore we should um, treat them separately. Uh, People Nowadays, pretend that the world is neatly divided into academic disciplines so that, you know, we can either talk about Christianity or talk about astronomy. But the truth is, it isn't. There's a lot of overlap in these fields. And part of what we learn by looking at the case of Bruno and Galileo is that they lived in that overlap. They both claim to be trying to be good Christians. Now, maybe to some extent they're lying. I don't know. But they claim to be trying to be very good, devout Christians that want to oppose the Catholic faith in absolutely nothing. This is what they say. But at the same time, they're using natural philosophy to speak about religion. They're using natural philosophy to interpret Christianity. And they, and they get in trouble for it. What gets them in trouble is that they're using what becomes known then as Pythagoreanism in order to explain the Bible. Now, now the people whose job it was back then to explain the Bible take great offense at that. It's like, you, you, you know, Galileo, you're not even a theologian. Who are you to tell us that you can explain some passage about some miracle in the Bible about the sun standing still when you, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. But Galileo thinks that he has these nice Pythagorean explanations. And so I think if we can look at the conflict and accept that these domains do overlap, then we can... We can accept sometimes we're wrong. You know, sometimes the Catholic Church has been wrong. Sometimes science has been wrong. For example, uh, Galileo is very wrong in thinking that the universe is uh, spherical and that the sun is unmoving at its center. He's just wrong. Uh, You know, we can say that. I don't see any shame in saying that. Similarly, I think the church was very wrong in murdering Giordano Bruno, especially when he again goes out of his way to repeatedly say he's a good Catholic. And secondly, he connects uh, astronomy with theology. One of the reasons he gives for saying that uh, there are many worlds, many planets, many stars, it's because he thinks that God is all-powerful. So to him, it follows necessarily and logically that an all-powerful God would create many worlds, not just one. And and, so, so if someone is a Catholic now, well, guess what? Here's a guy giving you a theological uh, harmony between belief in the omnipotence of God and the scope of the universe as we know it. In other words, uh, Giordano Bruno could be useful to the Catholic Church right now. Rather than being this uh, demonized, weird, heretic mystic, um, uh, there are lessons in how these um, individuals, whether it's Giordano Bruno or Galileo, did manage to negotiate, trying to put these things together, rather than thinking that we live in this moronic, nonsensical, schizophrenic world in which the disciplines are all boxes that are quite separated from each other by very clear-cut worlds. That's just absurd, it's lame, and, and it doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't, it doesn't address any of the, the interesting issues that naturally arise. Alberto Martinez's book is Burned Alive, Bruno, Galileo, and the Inquisition from Reaction Books. Thank you, Alberto, for sharing your work and your perspectives with us. Thank you so much, Matt. Take good care. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. You can find more resources for exploring this topic, other podcasts, video forums, archival spotlights, as well as opportunities to connect with our community of scholars at chstm.org. This podcast is made possible with the generous support of the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Rita Allen Foundation.